This week, Joe Biden took office as the 46th president of the United States. With Iran being one of his administration's top priorities in his first 100 days, he plans to hold early talks with world leaders ahead of efforts to re-enter the 2015 Iran nuclear deal or the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Today, we will explore what U.S. foreign policy towards Iran will look like under the Biden administration, where are the challenges, and if there are any hopeful gains ahead. Joining me here are my distinguished guests, Alex Batanka, the director of the Iran program at the Middle East Institute in Washington, D.C., where he specializes in Middle Eastern regional security affairs with a particular focus on Iran. His book, The Battle of the Ayatollahs in Iran, the United States Foreign Policy and Political Rivalry since 1979, will be published in 2021. And he is now working on a new one, Iran's Arab Strategy, Defending the Homeland or Exporting Khomeinism. Ali Reza Nader is a senior fellow focusing on Iran and US policy in the Middle East at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Prior to joining FDD, Ali Reza was a senior researcher at the Rand Corporation, where he, he authored numerous reports and studies on Iran, the Middle East, and US strategy. And throughout his career, he has advised US governments about Iran. Maryam Memar Sadeghi is a leading proponent for a democratic Iran. She is co founder of Tabana, e learning institute for Iranian civil society. Maryam previously directed the Middle East and North Africa Division at Freedom House, and immediately after the NATO bombing of Kosovo and Serbia, she worked for nearly three years in the Balkan region for the International Rescue Committee and the International Organization for Migration. And last but not least, Kamran Khansarinia is a policy director at the National Union for Democracy in Iran, a nonpartisan nonprofit organization for Iranian Americans, raising awareness about the freedom movement in Iran. In his role, he had research and writing, advocacy efforts in the policymaking communities, media relations, legislative efforts, and special projects. Welcome to you all. How is the Biden presidency being perceived in Iran? I think, uh, frankly, uh, Across the Iranian uh, regime, I think there's a sense of joy that the Trump administration is over, that he wasn't reelected. Uh, some of the Iranian officials, uh, including uh, President Hassan Rouhani, uh, openly says so. Uh, we had just a few hours ago Foreign Minister Javad Zarif publish in Foreign Affairs saying the same thing, welcoming this as a potential new turning point in relations between the United States and the Islamic Republic. Uh, so these are the ones who've come out and publicly kind of welcomed the Biden uh, presidency. Uh, Ayatollah Khamenei, who uh, frankly, as we uh, all know, I think far more important in, in this context, he has not said it in so many words. He hasn't welcomed uh, Joe Biden as president. Um, the Revolution Guards commanders, in fact, have said makes no difference in terms of the state of relations between the two countries. But I think they are uh, basically playing politics with it. Across the board, Nazanin, everyone in the regime in Tehran is happy. They really didn't know what to make of Trump. Uh, they assumed, uh, and rightly so, that he wasn't a war president, uh, but they didn't know whether there's going to be a military uh, you know, action by the Trump administration in the last weeks and months, and they feared that. But now that Trump is out of the White House, they're playing politics with it. The hardliners are saying it makes no difference. And time will show if it's going to make a big difference. I'm skeptical. I don't see the Iranian regime is ready to make the kinds of compromises one has to make uh, to make this a normal relationship, if you will. But at least on paper, you have the Rouhani, the Zarif team, so-called moderates in Tehran that are at least hoping for some tactical um, concessions from Washington, meaning sanctions relief. They will return go back and stick to the letter of the nuclear deal from 2015. But whether that's going to be enough to sort of say that's a breakthrough, again, as I said, I'm skeptical, but it might just win some time in the next few weeks and months as these two sides try and figure out what to do next. Ali Reza, the Trump administration's maximum pressure uh, campaign shifted the power 
balance uh, uh, in the Islamic Republic and of the Islamic Republic in the Middle East. Um, there was a concern that the Biden administration will repeat the wariness uh, of Obama administration to antagonize uh, Khamenei and the Islamic Republic, like first rushing to re-enter re another uh, Iran deal, uh, lift all the sanctions, and later, only later negotiate a stronger, a stronger deal. What are your views? Uh, are you still concerned? Are there concerns have been allayed or not? Uh, there is definitely reason to be concerned that the Biden administration uh, will repeat the Obama administration's deeply flawed policies on Iran, including uh, returning to the nuclear agreement or the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the JCPOA. Uh, Biden has said he wants to re-enter the agreement he has chosen officials that were involved with negotiating the JCPOA, uh, such as Wendy Sherman. And uh, most disconcertingly, he, has, uh, he is considering uh, picking officials uh, that are not tough on the Islamic Republic, such as Robert Malley, uh, to be the US envoy uh, to Iran. On the other hand, so much has changed in the last five years since the JCPOA was signed in 2015. I mean, the world has completely changed. Um, the United States has changed, the Middle East has changed, and Iran has changed. Uh, the Islamic Republic has faced two major popular uprisings in the last three years. Iranian officials uh, speak regularly of being on the verge of collapse or facing a major popular insurrection. Uh, the Middle East has rejected uh, the power and influence of the Islamic Republic. There have been widespread demonstrations against the regime in Iraq and Libya and elsewhere. And the Iranian economy uh, is doing extremely poorly uh, under the mismanagement, corruption, and uh, sanctions placed against the Islamic Republic for its uh, malignant behavior. Uh, one thing that I think that will really bind uh, the Biden administration, in addition to the changed realities, is the nature of sanctions. Uh, they, the new Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, has said that uh, he, he does not think that the U.S. should lift the ter terrorism designations against the Islamic Republic. Um, but lo let's look uh, what those designations are. Uh, the regime has been designated as a supporter of terrorism, uh, as have uh, the Iranian Central Bank, the entire financial sector in Iran, uh, major shipping, petrochemical, and uh, other uh, companies. So it'll be very, very difficult for the Biden administration to justify le uh, lifting these terrorism sanctions. And uh, the Biden administration will also face a lot of pressure from US allies in the Middle East that are very much against returning uh, to the JCPOA, including Israel, the United Arab Emirates, uh, Bahrain, countries that just uh, signed a very historic agreement for peace uh, called the Abraham Accords. So the world has changed dramatically. Uh, perhaps uh, <clears throat> the image of the political battle in DC hasn't changed so much. You know, you have the Democratic Party uh, advocating a return to the JCPOA and the Republican Party against it. But although the Democratic Party is in charge right now, I think it faces major, major obstacles to going back uh, to the JCPOA. Uh, Mariam, uh, you recently uh, wrote an article for Al Arabiya uh, that Biden needs to build on Trump's success to aid Iranian people. Indeed, um, you know he has already promised to revitalize uh, democracy and put it uh, at the forefront of his uh, agenda. And there is talk of an international summit um, to commit and prioritize and galvanize countries uh, for commitments in three areas, fighting corruption, uh, uh, defending against 
authoritarianism, advancing human rights at home and abroad. Um, what are your thoughts? How, how do you see the Biden administration, the potential and uh, that it may have uh, for the democracy movement and the civil society? John, thank you so much for having me. Um, I agree with my uh, friends and colleagues, uh, particularly comments by uh, Alex, that uh, the regime in Iran is um, delighted to have uh, the Trump administration gone, and it's for good reason. The maximum pressure campaign was, was successful against it. Uh, some of us here in the United States, Iranian Americans, were really caught in a tough position because the the president, the administration, the policy was um, by far the most effective one in the last uh, 42 years uh, against the regime and for the Iranian people and for democratic change. But that same uh, president here at home in the United States uh, was, was, was threatening to democratic institutions, processes, values. And so, um, you know, as you may, I, I'm saying this by way of introduction to what I think now the Biden administration should do and the pressure that people like myself and everyone here in this room, uh, I work with Kamran John and Ali Reza and uh, yourself, of course, Nazanin John, and we're doing the best that we can and will be more committed than ever to make sure that this administration understands that Iran has changed. Uh, the demands of the Iranian people have changed significantly. Um, it's not just that the region has come to understand uh, Arabs and Israelis are united against uh, the common enemy that is the Islamic Republic. The Iranian people, all different parts of society have come to understand that reformers or moderates and the hardliners, there's no distinction. And in fact, there's more uh, resentment and anger towards the reformists uh, than the hardliners or even Khamenei himself. Uh, because they're the ones that are out there making, making the uh, promises that are never kept and the lies and the insults and the humiliations of uh, what the reality is of Iranian people's lives and, and Zarif chief among, the, uh, among them. Um, going to Biden policy, um, I think there is always talk with any American administration, particularly in the early days, uh, after inauguration of intentions to promote democracy. Uh, I think that that's just standard across both parties, across all presidents. Uh, th but the, um, the truth is that every president and every party has uh, ways that they lean. And the Democratic Party, uh, unfortunately, leans towards criticism of Saudi Arabia, leans towards criticism on issues where uh, the, 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 the regime in question is actually a US ally and has historically been much softer on the Islamic Republic. What's changed here in Washington um, in, in mirror fashion to the changes on the ground in the region and inside Iran is that the voices that kept uh, giving false hope and false promise about the reformists, in particular the National Iranian American Council, are severely discredited and no longer looked to as interlocutors to make some kind of rapprochement happen. People see not just Iranian Americans, but the policymaking community in general, Washington in general, both parties understand that this is a um, uh, a stand-in for a lobby. It is the regime's lobby de facto here in the United States. Uh, it should be uh, registered under uh, FARA. Um, so I think that the Biden administration, if it is going to have a successful policy on Iran, uh, and not just for moral reasons or human rights reasons, needs to carry over the understanding that the Trump administration had, which was really the understanding that the George W. Bush administration had about Iran, uh, uh, about the Islamic Republic as a regime that is detested at home and a, a regime that, want, that, the, that the people of Iran want desperately to overthrow, not just because of the repression, but because of the corruption, which is, which is enmeshed with the support for terror and annihilation um, uh, outside of Iran's borders. 
the, the piece that I wrote in Al Arabiya and several pieces that I have uh, put out in the last year in particular have had really one goal and that is to uh, convince the United States government, whoever is in charge, that I Iran desperately needs planning for democracy, not just support for overthrow, but planning for the day after overthrow uh, so that Iran can make a very stable transition from a totalitarian regime that is at odds with peace to one that is stable, free, democratic. And I can speak more about that if there's time. Conran, uh, you maintain contact uh, with the Iranian American community and also Iranian democratic uh, uh, democracy activists across the political spectrum. How are they develop, uh, viewing these? No, uh, uh, thank you so much for inviting me. It's, uh, it's a privilege to be with you uh, and with uh, several friends here uh, today. As uh, Alex uh, and, and Mariam said, uh, I think uh, just at as the regime is elated, uh, many uh, Iranian Americans uh, and Iranian democracy advocates and activists and the opposition uh, are, uh, as a counterpoint, um, deflated uh, because uh, the Trump administration did put a lot of pressure uh, on the Islamic Republic. Uh, one thing, uh, though, that I will say, and, and it's a point that we often try to drive home, uh, is we have a responsibility as Iranian Americans to work uh, on both sides of the aisle to pressure whichever party uh, is in power, to pressure uh, representatives uh, in the House, uh, in the Senate, uh, and, and those in the White House and the executive staff uh, to look at the issue the way we do, uh, because it's it's the truth uh, and it's based in reality and it's based in facts and it's based uh, in uh, more importantly, uh, perhaps morality. Um, so while people are deflated uh, across the board, uh, it's, it's time to sort of, uh, you know, uh, pick ourselves up and go forward because we don't have an option uh, to sit on our hands uh, and, and sulk uh, and feel sorry for ourselves. Uh, Trump was in, in office for four years and he had lots of policies vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Islamic Republic that were beneficial, but he's no longer president. And so now it's, it's time to uh, work with the new administration uh, uh, to the extent possible, uh, pressure them when necessary uh, and, and see uh, what, where the common ground is. Uh, as, as was alluded to by yourself uh, and, uh, and Mariam, uh, this administration has talked to a really excellent game uh, in the campaign uh, and in the primary season about promoting human rights and democracy in its foreign policy. Uh, Joe Biden himself has a long history uh, of speaking uh, very eloquently on this topic uh, from back in his days uh, as a Senator on the Foreign Relations Committee uh, about uh, South Africa, uh, in which he has a video that just went viral a few months ago, uh, asking uh, President Reagan's then Secretary of State George Shultz, what was the US strategy to get rid of this nasty apartheid regime? Well, today the world has another nasty apartheid regime and it's the Islamic Republic. Uh, and so what we're asking and what we're pushing both uh, in the political sphere uh, and also in the media sphere is, is what is the policy uh, that can help the Iranian people be freed from today's, from 2021's nasty apartheid regime? Uh, because that's what the Islamic Republic is. Uh, and a lot of uh, the responsibility on our shoulders is making the argument that uh, that is what the Islamic Republic is, a nasty apartheid regime. Um, I think that a lot of the negotiations that took place during the Obama administration and uh, sort of a visceral reaction uh, from many in the Democratic Party to uh, President Trump's decision to withdraw from the nuclear deal has been to uh, sort of create this false notion of the Islamic Republic uh, as a partner uh, or uh, as, uh, as, uh, as an entity with goodwill towards the United States. In fact, it's the opposite. Um, Alex said quite rightly that any changes that the regime will make will be tactical changes, but its strategic uh, outlook will always be the same. It is based fundamentally on anti-Americanism. It's also based fundamentally on anti-Iranianness. It is an anti-Iranian regime, uh, not only an anti-American regime. Uh, so our responsibility is to sort of get out uh, of this uh, sulkin nature in which we find ourselves today uh, and, and make the argument uh, in any way we can uh, that a regime uh, that executes members of the LGBTQ community, a, a regime that destroys Iran's environment, a regime that considers half of its citizens women, 
to be second class citizens, even third class citizens, is not a regime that's worthy of being a partner of the United States. Uh, perhaps the administration will feel it necessary to negotiate on certain issues. And as frankly, all administrations since the Islamic uh, Revolution have. Um, but our, uh, our focus needs to be uh, on ensuring that human rights uh, and the right of self-determination of the Iranian people plays a fundamental role in whatever policy uh, this administration will take. Uh, and I think because of uh, some of the groups that were mentioned earlier, uh, having now been totally discredited uh, and, and really being a laughing stock, if I'm being frank, um, amongst policy circles, uh, there's an open space uh, for those of us who support uh, human rights and democracy uh, in Iran uh, to make an impact and work with uh, both parties. Alex, uh, in June, in less than six months, um, there's the Islamic Republic presidential elections. Um, and in a, on a, in a speech uh, on the 8th of January, uh, Mr. Khamenei laid out his position uh, for having uh, for uh, Iran to enter into any relations with the United States and saying that, well, it basically Iran doesn't, uh, the Islamic Republic doesn't trust the United States and is in no rush. And that the highest priority uh, for them is for the lifting of sanctions altogether on oil exports and the Iranian banking system, as well as on freezing of Iranian assets abro uh, abroad. Given the you know, all the amount of sanctions that there are and the complexity of everything. Is time really on the Ayatollah side? Uh, Nazanija, before I answer that one, let me just quickly add to what was said uh, nicely by, by my colleagues. Uh, the question in terms of democracy and the future of the Iranian people, I mean, I can't think of anything else more important, frankly, for certainly the ones on diaspora who, who look back at the old country and, and grieve over what's going on uh, on so many levels. Uh, and it, frankly, I think, you know, time will show if President Biden has the bandwidth to, to do uh, more than just sort of the uh, standard uh, rhetoric in terms of spreading democracy around. I mean, we know he's going to have a, a full plate here at home in the United States, so much that needs to be attended to here. Um, and time will show whether he will go out there and actually uh, you know, put out an American vision, uh, and uh, you know, if you if you want to continue a tra transactional foreign policy that some people criticize President Trump to be pursuing, well, that's one thing. If you want to change the game entirely, uh, that would be much bolder. It would be a heavy lifting, but you know, it, it would be something a lot of us, I think, would would cherish to see happen. Uh, in terms of the June elections in Iran and Ayatollah Khamenei, where he stands, well. In July of 2021, if memory serves me right, Ayatollah Khamenei will turn 82. Uh, he doesn't look at the next Iranian presidential elections as anything but uh, paving the way for the consolidation process um, by the camp that he's overseeing. And I mean, you could argue, argue that he oversees the entire regime he does, but if I may just um, sort of for a second pretend that there are people inside the Islamic Republic, and I think that's the case, that aren't necessarily as committed to the vision of Ayatollah Khamenei as others. Uh, so Ayatollah Khamenei wants uh, someone from his own kind of background, if you will, ideological background and, and vision to take over. So I think what I'm, what I'm seeing when I look at the uh, debate in Tehran, the movements that various players are making, I think they are thinking small which is always how the Islamic Republic thinks. They think small, they think about how do they maintain power in Tehran. Iranian people's interest or Iranian national interest certainly comes uh, later on the list, if it's on the list. It's about the regime survival. It's about the interest of a, a few people that are running the Islamic Republic, uh, not least Ayatollah Khamenei, his family, his inner circle. And they're looking at the elections coming up and the Biden presidency and everything else, frankly, in 2021, in terms of what can they do to, um, you know, make sure nothing happens to this uh, uh, camp's group on power once Ayatollah Khamenei, who, as I said, is 82, once he leaves the stage. So I think they're, again, thinking along those terms. They're not thinking in terms of, you know, what do we have to do to end U.S.-Iran hostilities? What do we have to do to overturn uh, or undo the damage that Iran the Islamic Republic's foreign policy has brought uh, on, onto the country the last few 
decades or so. So I, I'm skeptical on that. I, I think he's, um, you know, when I say they're thinking small, what do I mean by that? I mean, they're thinking in terms of getting a few billions of dollars here and there in Korean or Indian or Chinese banks unfrozen, sent back to Iran so they can have some money to play with. But they're not thinking about the hundreds of billions of dollars in investment a free, uh, healthy Iran Iranian uh, country could could have access to it. That, that's not how they're thinking. And that's why I'm skeptical. So um, I, I'm not holding my breath. The next elections in uh, June of 2021 will probably be an election where you got a bunch of different personalities, all of them men coming from the hardline camp, people like Saeed Jalili, uh, Ghalibaf, Ali Larijani, uh, Hossein Dehqan, they almost all come from the Revolutionary Guards. The Revolutionary Guards wants to be the mover and the shaker, wants to decide who will be the next Iranian Supreme Leader, feels that it's entitled to make that decision. They always go back to their uh, service during the Iran-Iraq war, and they believe that they have the right to choose the destiny of this country. But uh, the trouble for the Iranian people is the Revolutionary Guards are at the heart of the problem of, uh, of Iran's isolation, including what they're doing in the region. What the Revolutionary Guards is doing in Iraq, uh, in Lebanon, in Syria, and elsewhere is really, it's hard to argue how that is serving Iranian national interest the way Javad Zarif wrote in his uh, foreign affairs uh, piece today. It's really hard to ask Iranians in the streets of Tehran, Yaz, Mashhad, and elsewhere and say, what is this uh, regime doing for enhancing your security? It's a, it's a tough question. The regime, the regime doesn't have an answer. And it comes down to the people to push back. It's tough to push back against a regime that has all the arms, but that's the only thing you really can do unless, as I said, there is a vision coming from a place like Washington and elsewhere where the outside world can help the aspirations of the Iranian people. Ali is a... Uh... Alex talked about small thinking. And uh, last week when uh, uh, the Islamic Republic announced that it was producing 20% enriched uranium in, uh, in a clear breach of the Iran deal, that it was basically to increase its leverage uh, for, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, any negotiations or talks uh, with the United States. Now, it has also threatened other, several other steps um, to build up its leverage. Uh, like um, uh, they've announced that they are in, a, they've uh, announced to uh, IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, that they intend to start producing uranium metal, which can be used to develop nuclear warheads. How does Israel view and is preparing for this? I mean, is, is time on the side of peace in the Middle East? As you said, Islamic Republic is using the nuclear uh, program really as a form of blackmail. It, um, it has really, that's the only card it has to play. Anytime uh, it wants um, to get something from the you know, outside world, from the US, from Europe, it ramps up its nuclear program. And it does create an effect in places like Washington, DC. People start panicking here. And I think uh, this feeds this urge to engage diplomatically with the regime and uh, reach a diplomatic solution uh, to this issue. Uh, on the other hand, the Israelis are very well positioned to uh, obstruct reentry into the JCPOA uh, because they rightly fear that the JCPOA will allow Iran to produce nuclear weapons in the future. If you look at the nuclear agreement, uh, I think the biggest flaw in the agreement is the fact that uh, once uh, most of the agreement comes to an end, uh, the Islamic Republic will have a vast and advanced nuclear infrastructure that could produce multiple nuclear weapons. I mean, the JCPOA was not a solution. I think it was just a uh, temporary stopgap measure more than anything. Uh, and the Israelis have uh, thought this through and they've taken action against the regime's nuclear facilities. Um, we saw that there were major attacks against uh, the main nuclear facility at Natanz last year, uh, in addition to uh, a major military facility. Um, and uh, we believe that Israel also was behind uh, the assassination of the regime's top 
nuclear weapons expert, uh, Fakhri Zadeh. Uh, he was assassinated in the middle of Tehran. Um, and that was a very brazen operation, which to me demonstrated that Israel has uh, established uh, a very effective network within Iran. Uh, it has managed, I believe, to uh, possibly even uh, attract defectors from the Islamic Republic. It's hard for me to imagine that the Israelis would be able to conduct so many operations in Iran without uh, having penetrated the security forces, uh, including the Revolutionary Guards, which again also demonstrates that the regime is very weak uh, in a way, and perhaps even divided against itself. So I wouldn't be surprised if as negotiations um, continue and if there are signs that uh, Washington will give in to the regime's nuclear blackmail that the Israelis will take action, that we'll, we, we will see uh, other uh, sabotage operations in Iran. Um, and uh, these operations have also demonstrated that uh, the regime is not going to respond by uh, launching a massive war as uh, it has threatened to do so. And one of the things that I think the regime did very effectively, including Zarif and his lobby in DC, uh, was to threaten war every time the Islamic Republic was under pressure. And I think uh, the Obama administration made a very poor strategic and moral decision to go along with that uh, because it created this framework of either uh, we signed a nuclear agreement or there will be war. But the events of the past uh, four years uh, during the Trump administration maximum pressure campaign have shown that um, the Islamic Republic can be pushed very hard, that there can be attacks and sabotage uh, operations against these nuclear facilities that uh, major regime officials like Qasem Soleimani and Fakhri Zadeh can be assassinated and war will not come. There won't be massive war in the Middle East as the, you know, the so-called, uh, I think, of being fake progressives in DC claim. Um, and I think that has lost a lot of value, uh, the threat of war for people like Zarif. And he, and he really knows it. I, and I, do believe despite its rhetoric, the Biden administration also knows that in a lot of ways, this regime is very weak. Um, during his uh, testimony before the Senate, during his confirmation, uh, the Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, when he was asked about Qasem Soleimani's killing, he said he didn't sh shed any tears over it, but he didn't think it made America safe. I think that's really a political statement. Of course, Soleimani's killing made America safe. It made America safer. It made this Middle East safer. And I think it created opportunities for the Iranian people who uh, detest the Revolutionary Guards and people like Qasem Soleimani. Um, most Iranians do anyways. You know, there, there are regime supporters in Iran, and of course, uh, here. But to summarize, uh, the Israelis and their allies in the Middle East, uh, including the UAE, which just purchased um, 50 very advanced F-35 uh, fighter jets, are very well positioned to prevent a return uh, to the policy of appeasement uh, pursued under the Obama administration. Alex, back to you. How do the other countries in the Middle East uh, look at the situation, uh, especially, you know, the Arab uh, countries of the Persian Gulf? You know, I, they really are in a tough spot. We, we just heard that this week, um, uh, uh, the uh, Anwar Gargash, Dr. Gargash from UAE, again, he put out uh, a, a statement saying, we really cannot afford a war, um, uh, you know, a new conflict in the Middle East. We do want a, a political solution to be found. Um, we've heard similar things coming out of Riyadh this week again. Uh, I think the Saudi foreign minister just today said they don't think the Iranians are, um, the Iranian regime is serious about uh, a dialogue, um, but, you know, um, it, they might give it a go. Look, Nazanin John, I think one of the issues when it comes to the Gulf states is, is the following. We kind of touched on it already today. 
On the one hand, they have uh, felt, if you're sitting in Abu Dhabi, Riyadh and elsewhere in the region, you hear uh, Zarif speak in a certain language about, you know, let's, let's have a dialogue. You know, again, in his piece that I've repeatedly mentioned today, he refers to HOPE, the Hormoz uh, Peace Initiative. You know, the Islamic Republic have a history of, of floating such initiatives. Going back to 1986, there's been a number of them. Some of them are their own, some of them are what the Russians give to Iran to give to the region and so forth. The reality is the Gulf states, and we can debate that, that's a separate conversation. Don't feel confident in sitting in that room and talking to Iran without having the United States back them up. That's just the reality of the Gulf states. They want the United States to be part of party to those regional negotiations. So again, if we put human rights in Iran, which is important to me, but for a second, let's put that aside and just talk about hard national interest of the United States. The Biden administration might decide, I mean, I'm just going to give you one scenario. They might decide that, you know what, the one thing that we care about more than anything else, and which is exactly what the Obama administration believed, it's the Iranian nuclear program. We don't want it to see advance anymore. We don't want to see a nuclear arms race in the region. We're going to cut a deal with the Iranians on that. We're going to lift some of the sanctions, uh, but a lot of the other sanctions are unrelated to the nuclear issue will stay. But instead of what Obama administration did, which was to hope that the Iranian regime will behave better, would make different choices in the region, that the Biden administration will be proactive. Pro proactive in the sense of what just Ali Reza described what the Israelis are doing, which is to hit Iran hard kinetically in the region. So you keep the nuclear uh, program, if you will, under an agreement, but you hit Iran in the region, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Iraq and elsewhere. I mean, that's a solution perhaps by, by some, uh, in, I doubt very much this is gonna be having many supporters in the Biden administration. What I'm saying is there are ways of dealing with what Iran is doing in the region. The Gulf states certainly have had that in mind, which is to sort of show Iran force, that Iran only respects force. If you hit them hard, they'll pull back. But this notion that there are moderates that you can empower by choosing certain policies over others, and I've heard it so many times over the years by, by uh, Arab uh, leaders who say, we wish there were real moderates in Tehran. And there are maybe moderate figures in, in Tehran, but experience teaches us these moderates don't have any power. They don't have the power to make decisions in Baghdad or in Sana or in Beirut, where the Arab world is, is, has its uh, interests. So they're going to come at this, uh, uh, you know, they can't afford to turn their backs on the Biden administration. That's for sure. The Gulf states need to work with the Biden administration. And the question going forward is how can they help the Biden administration and vice versa if there's an agreement in terms of the best next steps to take vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Islamic Republic? Mariam, the Trump administration State Department uh, developed a really very strong Iran-focused social media campaign to ex exert maximum pressure uh, on the clerics in Tehran. How do you think this strategy will evolve uh, under a Biden administration? The social media campaign was really part of a larger uh, strategy, as you said, of maximum pressure and within maximum pressure, the focus on um, human rights and, and rhetoric that places the regime uh, with its back against the wall, uh, very similar to what Reagan did with the Soviets and, and, and communism. It's, it was extremely effective um, because it showed the Iranian people that the United States government understands what they're up against and understands that the United States government understands what they understand. And that is that the moderates are really nothing more than a lie. Uh, this was a revolution in US policy making is very important. I personally think it's gonna be very hard for the Biden administration to pretend that it doesn't also understand that truth um, because it's, it's so self-evident now. The slogans on the street, not to mention the fact that a United States president was willing to acknowledge that truth. Ali Reza mentioned uh, the comment uh, by Blinken that he didn't shed tears over the assassination of Soleimani, but that he thinks the United States is, is less safe because of it. This is a highly partisan comment, and it sort of shows the, the risk we face with a Biden administration. Understanding the truth that Soleimani was evil, but not being willing to 
uh, accept it outright and to articulate it as such. Václav Havel was very eloquent on this topic uh, of war and peace and the intersection of that with uh, freedom. Um, and it goes to the heart of what was wrong with the JCPOA. Um, the, the Obama administration believed, as Alex said, the Biden administration may well believe that they can deal with the nuclear issue and then try to deal with these other issues such as um, interference in the region, global terrorism, human rights separately. Uh, as, as recently as last week, Wendy Sherman um, and Jake Sullivan were saying, still saying the same thing. But history shows that once they had the deal, once the extortion was done by the regime, there was no reason for it to be a good actor in the region. Not, only, not just that, but to really ramp up the killing of innocent people, particularly in Syria. So not only was the JCPOA not something that secured any kind of peace, it actually enabled war. That's, that's the biggest irony uh, about it. Going back to your question, Nazanin John, about whether I think that the successes that the Trump administration had with regards to outreach to the Iranian people is something that can continue under the Biden administration. Well, it all depends on what the Biden administration is going to do in terms of being honest with the nature about the nature of the regime. If it's honest and forthright about the about what everybody in the region and the Iranian people and the Trump administration could see as what this um, uh, regime is today, then it surely can do so. And it can only add to its leverage at the negotiating table. I mean, there is nothing to be afraid of with negotiations. There's nothing inherently uh, wrong or immoral with nego about negotiating with an evil regime. Reagan did it. Uh, Reagan called the Soviets an evil empire and at the same time negotiated with them. And when, when negotiating with them about nuclear and ballistic and foreign wars and proxies, at the same time, in the same room, exerted pressure on Gorbachev about dissidents, about releasing them, about allowing Jews to go to Israel. Um, so they're not only are they not mutually exclusive, but they actually add to the leverage and the moral legitimacy that the United States has. Why are we ashamed? We should be proud that we as a country are able to stand for human rights. When we walk into the negotiating room with Javad Zarif, chief liar of a, of a, a deeply immoral regime, we should be insisting on our values, not shying away from them. Comrade John, uh, Aaron David Miller, a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, uh, uh, said that Iran is, uh, is an issue that can't wait and that with upcoming elections and may, uh, the situation may es escalate uh, and the situation is, um, you know, is determined by domestic political reasons. Um, can you give us a sense of uh, direction on where the Iranian the democracy activists are heading? Uh, are they dispersed as they have been for the last four decades? And what uh, what promise is there? Well, first of all, with with all due respect to to Mr. Miller and uh, the storied institution um, that he represents, uh, he, he's incorrect. Um, this absolutely can wait. Uh, the Biden administration should not be in any rush uh, to alleviate the pressure on the Islamic Republic. The Biden administration should not be in any rush uh, to give concessions to uh, or points to. Uh, the Islamic Republic. Uh, at some point, of course, this issue has to be addressed. Um, as Mariam said, it has to uh, and should be, uh, and if there's a proper strategy, will be addressed holistically uh, in something like a, a Hel Helsinki-like dialogue uh, in which all uh, factors are on the table. Because going back to the point that all three of my colleagues mentioned, uh, if you're not doing that, if you're not looking at the ballistic missile program, uh, the usurpation of the sovereignty uh, of, of Iraqis, of Lebanese, of Yemenis, uh, of other people in, in the Middle East, if you're not looking at the human rights issue at the same time that you're looking at the nuclear issue, uh, then it, it, it's simply a poor strategy uh, for the simple reason that the Islamic Republic is not going to come back to the negotiating table once they've gotten what they want. 
all Ali Khamenei needs, all the Islamic Republic needs, uh, is, is a small trickle of income. They are so starved uh, for cash uh, right now for their priorities, um, which, uh, as Alex mentioned, uh, are not the Iranian people or Iran's national interests. Rather, uh, it's buttressing uh, the, the butcherous regime of Bashar Assad in Syria, uh, supporting Hamas, supporting Hezbollah. That, those are their priorities. Um, if they have a small trickle of income uh, from being able to once again sell oil uh, or from uh, some uh, foreign companies willing to take the immense risk, in my view, uh, of doing business with the Islamic Republic, uh, that will be all they need. Uh, they won't live uh, uh, lavishly. I mean, the country won't uh, flourish, of course. Uh, the, the mullahs will live lavishly as they do now and have uh, for 42 years. Um, but that's all that this regime needs to survive. And as Alex uh, properly mentioned, that is their uh, guiding starts, their ultimate priority. And so there will be no incentive uh, for them to come back to the table to discuss the ballistic missile program, to discuss regional usurpation, which are security uh, uh, imperatives, both for Arab nations in the Persian Gulf, uh, for Israel, and for the United States, of course. So to an extent, uh, the issue of human rights and democracy in Iran is inseparable from the issue of American national security. They're fundamentally tied because as long as uh, there is an undemocratic anti-human rights regime, such as the Islamic Republic in power in Iran, it will continue to be at odds with, and it will continue to be a threat to US national security. So uh, we, can, we can look at those two issues uh, in silos um, from a, an analytical uh, academic perspective, but in reality, uh, they're tied uniquely together and in, in my view, inseparable. Uh, and so a proper strategy will address all of those points. It, to answer your question directly, uh, it's a very good one because unfortunately, one of our weak notes uh, as those opposed to uh, the Islamic Republic in whatever role we play, be we Iranian Americans, be we actual members of, of, of political opposition uh, or analysts and academics who uh, you know whose heart beat uh, for Iran and the Iranian people and and and, and which is broken uh, by the crimes of this regime has been the lack of connectivity and unity between these forces. I do think uh, that there is a sign for hope. I, I think that uh, two key factors uh, are playing into this. The first of which is it has simply gone on for so long uh, and Iran uh, is in such a dire situation. I mean, uh, you'll hear this often if you speak to Iranians that the country is literally going away. I mean, there will, no, there will be no Iran at some point. Uh, if this Islamic Republic uh, stays in power. Uh, it faces many threats from environmental threats. Iran's water is evaporating. There will be tens of millions of environmental refugees that will flood into the rest of the Middle East, that will flood into Europe because Iranians will have no water. Uh, so long as this regime stays in power, you face the increased threat uh, of ethnic separatists on Iran's borders, uh, breaking the country up. Uh, which some foreign powers Mitch, may have interest uh, in supporting. Uh, and uh, if, if one part of, of Iran uh, breaks away, it, it won't be Iran anymore. Uh, so there are immense threats. Um, I think the gravity of those threats, however, uh, has forced many uh, to finally uh, be willing to come and, and sit at the table and, and, and reach some sort of accords and form some sort of unified front uh, to oppose the Islamic Republic on many levels. The other thing which we have on our side uh, is, is a really unique symbol um, of hope, of unity, uh, and, and of progress for Iran, and, and that's Prince Reza Pahlavi. And uh, he has stood so strongly uh, on these issues for 42 years. Uh, he's, uh, I, I think, uh, often derided by um, some people uh, in Washington not Alex, of course, because uh, he's an excellent uh, and, and honest uh, analyst and, and academic, but many people um, you know, say that uh, uh, he's extremely relevant in Washington and irrelevant in Iran, um, when in fact he is most relevant in Iran. And, and he's a person to whom millions of Iranians look uh, as a source of hope. Um, and what's so unique is that um, though he is um, the heir to the Iranian throne, uh, his sole focus is on uniting Iranians around a single goal, which is saving the country. Uh, and when you have somebody with that sort of historical um, 
backing and that sort of historical import and name recognition whose sole goal is not himself or his throne or some palace, but saving the country. Uh, that, that serves as an inspiration and as a role model for other opposition forces. Um, and, and I think his unique role in bringing all sorts of groups together from communists to former revolutionaries, to former reformists, to Republicans, to all sorts of groups together is critical. Um, and I think if the, if the opposition forces are wise, they will heed uh, the calls that he gives. Uh, it's not about one person. It's not about Reza Pahlavi. It's about the country. Uh, and, and that's what's most critical. So I, I think there are signs for hope. Um, it's up to political groups to take that chance uh, and to come together uh, because if we're going to work with or try to speak with the Biden administration or other foreign powers, we need to be able to say, don't work with the Islamic Republic. Here's an alternative. And that's our task is to present that properly. Um, and, and I think we have a unique opportunity to do so. So it's, 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 it's difficult, uh, but there are signs for hope. Uh, when you have, uh, as Alex mentioned, you know, Javad Zarif writing today uh, in Foreign Affairs, and he has a line about uh, uh, the U.S. being a, a lawless regime and breaking international laws, um, you need to look a bit more in his backyard, uh, because uh, 18 months ago uh, or so, uh, when Iranians took to the streets in a massive anti-regime uprising, uprising, Javad Zarif and his regime mounted heavy machine guns and slaughtered between 1,500, some say up to 8,000 civilians. That's not a regime uh, that can last forever. Uh, and uh, it, and I, I think there are lots of signs for hope. Well, thank you all uh, to all of you for accepting my invitation, for joining uh, us here today. And I hope uh, we will be able to hear more of your thoughts uh, in the coming uh, months. Uh, uh, thank you again.